All right. Uh, well, hello, hello. Uh, good to see. Well, I'm not seeing anyone. Good to be here with you all again. Um, it's been a long time. Uh, not that long, but anyways. So um, what I wanted to do today um, is I essentially did uh, a lesson. I think one of the, the first ones I did here, at least uh, affiliated with Chess Dojo, which was um, <clears throat> Uh, talking about the Carlsbad structure. And of course, there aren't a lot of um, human games going on right now. I mean, with the COVID and everything, I mean, there are a few, but not that many. And uh, I actually want to revisit the Carlsbad structure and build on what we uh, had talked about before. And um, essentially, I found some really interesting games uh, in the engine world that really could help add to our knowledge and understanding. And um, not enough people um, actually follow these TSEC games. Um, uh, Ryo in the, in the chat's telling me, oh, TSEC, yeah, that's, yeah, totally uh, the case. Um, now, you know, you might say, well, engine games, what's the point? Why, why you do them? Well, the point is, is that those games are played at a very high level. And even if you don't like draws and so on, these aren't your ordinary draws. These are these are positions where both sides pursue very dynamic strategies that you might not have even been aware of. And so if you can just kind of download uh, some, some concepts, um, you will see different ways of playing that will open your, your eyes to, to you know, amazing things. And so what I do typically is I go over these games without an engine. And when I'm confused about something or when I would have done something differently, I create a two to four move variation that would have been the line that I consider. And then I check that to see how far off or what the evaluation of that consideration is. And kind of by trial and error, you're able to figure out like, you know, whether I could do this or whether I could do that. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, that would be, that's a very useful way to kind of go about your business. So just a quick review before we jump right in. Um, I do have a game up here, but I, I do actually want to go very quickly. I'm going to alt tab to, uh, to some skeletons. So again, we I don't I don't want to spend too much time on this because we it, I mean there is a video up on that where we discussed these skeletons before. But just to refresh your memory, I'm going to click through some of these Carlsbad skeletons in this database I made. So the first one is uh, Carlsbad one. So um, if if you recall, this is probably the skeleton that you see. Uh, do you see the skeletons actually? Do you see the skeleton? I think so. No, I'm I'm getting I'm getting no. Um, Kostyar, Greg, do you see the skeleton? No. Okay, let me stop sharing and then reshare. Is that okay, or or will that compromise the? That maybe I'll just do the whole screen. And there we go. All right. So I'm going to do whole screen. And now, do you see the skeleton? Perfect. Okay. So sorry about that technical difficulty. So the first skeleton uh, we actually discussed before, which was um, this like typical Carlsbad structure right after the exchange variation, we have CD5, ED5, and uh, white has a queen side, uh, oh, sorry, black has a queen side pawn majority and white has a king side pawn majority, that's typical. And you might see white playing for B4, B5 to undermine the C6 point. Um, so, Keep that in mind. That's something that we've seen before. The next skeleton I'm going to go to is, is uh, Carlsbad 2. So let me go to this skeleton. So this skeleton, you can see very clearly A4, B5 is coming up, and we have another skeleton where uh, B5 is on the horizon. There's an undermining of C6, very similar to the first skeleton. Um, right, because you have a position where you know, white's trying to undermine on the queen side, and black hasn't made any real progress elsewhere. Um, yeah. All right. Now I'm going to go to skeleton three. <laughs> this one is kind of like the dream, um, where essentially white was actually able to kind of pinpoint the c6 weakness, trade the other pawns, and this is like a dream setup where if white has like a heavy piece end game or and can kind of focus in on the c6 weakness you know, it's like not, not the most fun for, uh, for Black to deal with, just how to deal with that backward pawn that's difficult to liberate, right? Um, that's one that would be the dream kind of setup if the minority attack goes really, really well. Um, uh, a few more, and then we're going to move on. Um, 
Now we saw this one, uh, we see uh, white, black actually going C5. So instead, after B5, instead of allowing the B takes C6, B takes C6, you have the C5 move, which basically says, you know what, I'm not going to allow you to fix the C6 pawn, but I am potentially giving myself uh, an isolated pawn. And I'm saying that that's the lesser evil. Um, that's something that we, we explored last time. And then a few more, and we're out of the woods. Uh, this one is kind of consistent with the Bachvinik attack. Um, we see uh, F3 and then E4 typically is the move that uh, white's going to follow up with. If white doesn't get an E4, it's a massive problem for, uh, let me full screen this. Uh, if it's not, if white does not get an E4, it's a massive problem for black because the E3 pawn, or for white, excuse me, because the E3 pawn is backward and weak. So typically white is going to try to get an E4 with this skeleton. Two more or three more. This one is actually a funny one. Uh, it's where white actually goes a5 instead of going for b5. Uh, this one is actually typically not a desirable skeleton for white, even though it looks really good in that you've created the, the backward pawn for, um, for black. Uh, can anyone tell me why this, this skeleton is usually not very good for white? Uh, I, I see some excellent answers, some excellent answers already. Um, I'm gonna throw it to Aradya. Yeah, so like the uh, main thing I thought is that like there's no counterplay on the queen side anymore, and probably maybe we can get our knight to like b6 or c5, but it's not that useful though because like it's not really doing anything. Also, the queen side's closed, so like you can't like put any rooks or something there. Exactly. Yeah, you're right on the money. A lot of and there, I mean, of course, you have to really, you know, judge by the position, but a lot of times when you see this fixed structure, this is actually a disaster for white, because what it means is that there is no more counterplay as far as, op as far as targets and opening the position, and usually black is allowed to create very dangerous counterplay uh, with their piece of their pieces on the, on the king side, because they do have a slight space advantage as long as, um, you know, E4 is not happening. Um, and so very often this A5, B4 thing, as long as B7 is, is protected, totally shuts down white's play. And as a, a common mistake, you will see some people play A5, stick a knight on C5 and be very thrilled with the development, but it's actually not, uh, you know, such a great thing necessarily. So uh, right on the money about the lack of counterplay. Um, all right. Two more and then we're finally done and we move on to the skeleton I'm showing. All right, so this one H3, very similar to uh, the position with the pawn H2. The only thing that you know is important to note, and uh, we did mention this, um, let me full screen this again, is that um, of course with the pawn H3, it is a bit, uh, it, it does create hook opportunities. And I did mention that there are sac sacrifices related to capturing on H3 that you should be aware of. and um, and which are very possible. Of course, the other thing is when you've played h3, uh, f3 is really not realistic because you've weakened the g3 square to such an extent that it's just not really happening. Um, you weaken too many dark squares. It's just, you're not justified in going through the Bopfinic plan anymore. Okay, last but not least, um, this structure with uh, where the black plays b5 after uh, a3 and e4, a3 and b4 is also um, something to know. Um, this one is very useful right when white plays b4 and the knight is still on c3. And the idea is that even though you've gotten this backward pawn on c6, the knight on c3 can install itself on c5, which is usually kind of desirable. This is a very double-edged structure though, because I will say, you know, you have to be confident dealing with the, the backward c pawn. And, and, you know, in a dream scenario, you'd love to get your knight on to c4 via d6 or B6, but sometimes that doesn't happen and you have to be com confident and comfortable saying, well, C6 isn't really a target and I can try to undermine the B4 pawn, play on the A file with an ultimate A5. Okay, we just went through eight skeletons very quickly, just kind of reviewing the concepts. Um, definitely, uh, a, definitely a very interesting position, but not what we're working, what we're trying to go for here. What we're going for here is a game with an entirely new skeleton or one that we didn't discuss, which I think is really, really valuable. And this game was a draw uh, to be sure, but this is not your, this is not your everyday draw. So I, I'm, I'm really excited 
to, uh, let me do board only just to change the view um, to show this one because it's, oh, no, that's not what I want. Okay. Is this, is this full screen looking reasonable, Kostya? Just checking with you. Is this a reasonable full screen we have here? Okay, cool. cool. Um, so this is, um, this game is not your everyday draw. And I, I just, I'm, I was so shocked and happy and ecstatic when I saw it and it was played this year. Um, so uh, let's just take a look, understand the concepts and, uh, and keep it moving. So one thing that I did not mention a whole ton, and I'm, I'm going to go talk about a little bit as we go through the game, is the, ex the exchanging of the dark squared bishops. Because in the modern treatment of the system, you see Black a lot of the times trading these dark squared bishops. Um, and that doesn't happen very quickly here. And I really want you to think about why that is, how that happens, and so on. So keep that in mind as we go through. All right, so Komodo versus Leela Zero, 2021. Let's get it. C4, E6, D4, Knight F6, Knight C3, D5. Many, many a Carl's dad go through this move order for someone that, you know, might be wary of, you know, I don't know, Trumpowski or something like that. A lot of people might start with E6. Anyway, uh, C takes D5, E takes D5, Bishop G5, Bishop E7, E3, castles, Bishop D3, C6, and Knight F3. Okay, so... Knight of three is the first kind of move where you can really do a bit of information gathering about the strategy that white is employing in the system. What can anyone tell me here about knight of three? Uh, hi. So basically, I think when you play knight of three, um, you're basically saying that you're going to play for rook b1, b4, b5 little, and you're committing to a minority attack kind of, because normally when you put the knight on e2, you go for f3, e4, I guess. Excellent, excellent. So knight f3 says, I'm not going for Bothnik, Bothnik attack. I'm going for, uh, or Bothnik plan. I'm going for a uh, minority plan, typically. That's typically the understanding. Um, and uh, that's that's pretty much all you need to kind of gather from at this point. So let's keep it moving. Uh, and there are some other people that thought about that as well. So excellent, uh, excellent thinking. All right, so knight f3, rook e8. And now black white played queen c2 so this was kind of interesting to me because it's this is very typical we see this position you know h6 is kind of h7 is under fire right now um with the queen lined up against h7 and a lot of times uh in the structure um in, in the modern games you see a lot of people going for this plan with h6 and knight h5 and what I was already asking when I was looking at this is why didn't Black do this now? Because a lot of times you'd see this plan of h6, bishop h4, and then knight h5. And the idea is that you trade these dark squared bishops um, after something like bishop takes e7, queen e takes e7, and you argue with those dark squared bishops gone, um, there's not as much pressure on your queen side. And of course, when you trade a pair of minor pieces, typically that is helpful for Black. Now, you do temporarily put the knight on h5, but a lot of times it root groups back to f6. If white is sleeping at the wheel and plays move like queen c2, you just have this move knight f4, taking advantage of the pin on e1, uh, which is a very annoying move to contend with. And this is something that, you know, there have been many games from that have the contours of this exchange. And so already it's like, well, why did black not do that? And something that I was thinking was, well, maybe instead of bishop h4, white's going to go bishop f4. And then if knight h5, well, okay, if the bishop drops back to g3, we are happily going to pick off the bishop pair. But there's a bit of an annoying, you know, kind of way to kind of resist here um, with bishop e5. And you see this sometimes in slots, like uh, we can talk about that in a moment. But the point is, is that after a move like knight d7, still insisting on trying to get the, the, uh, the bishop uh, on e5. White can play, can kind of say, you know what, maybe you take that bishop. Maybe I go like queen c2. And you have this issue here where knight takes e5 might not necessarily be super desirable. Um, why not that? Why might that be, not be the case? Uh, I said then the knight on h5 gets trapped by the pawn on e5. Right. So knight takes e5, pawn takes e5, and all of a sudden, okay, you can't go g4 yet, but this wedge is an issue. Um, G4 is uh, is an idea. Maybe White will start with H3 and then G4, or maybe even better, Rook G1 and G4. 
Um, you know, white can castle queenside and the rook is lined up against the queen. And the presence of this h6 move makes liberating the knight a little less uh, comfortable than it otherwise would be because black would maybe be a little bit more enthusiastic about playing g6 if the pawn was back on h7. Um, so, you know, basically g6 is a little soft, something to be concerned about. And, you know, going for that, uh, you know, that, that bishop uh, uh, pair might have come to kind of bite you a little bit. And so that's something that like was like, okay, like h6 is not being played right away. Um, what's the deal with that? And, you know, understanding that or thinking about that can really help you understand move by move. And I, I want you to think about that concept as we go forward. So anyway, after knight f3, rook e8, queen c2, black played h6, and now bishop f4 happened. And so what changed a little bit here? Well, they're not going to go for knight h5. Um, and so black now went bishop g4. And this is a move that's very, very interesting, um, very dynamic looking. You attack the knight on f3. I consider it to be a little bit risky, but I want to ask very quickly before we get into bishop g4, why not just knight bd7 here with the idea of knight h5 next? Um, What's wrong with this? So I, I do want to I want to give a shout out very quickly to the people that are thinking knight b5, but that just doesn't work actually because after knight b5, there's just c takes b5, and you know if you play bishop c7, there's bishop b4 check intermediate move, and then the queen is the e7 square. So that sacrifice doesn't quite work because the king is still on e1. Um, but Austin, uh, you're right on the money. So why don't you uh, share, share, tell us all what you're thinking, if you if you can. Yeah. yeah so uh, I think uh, if you delay with knight d7, black uh, white can play h3, and after knight h5, you can play bishop h2. So uh, you can't take the bishop anymore. Exactly. And this is actually something that's very important to understand: is if the knight is on d7, you know, and and you don't have and white has delayed castling, then h3, bishop h2 is huge. And then also, again, now maybe the, you know, some other people talking about long castle in the chat, the hook opportunities might come into play. Maybe white says, you know what, forget about castling kingside. I'm going to castle queenside, and you've created a hook so that g4, g5 might be an issue. Um, so, uh, yeah, right on the money. This Now h3, and now we preserve the bishop. And all of a sudden, black didn't get to trade a pair of minor pieces like they normally do. Um, so uh, very, very interesting nuance here. Um, now, after h6, bishop f4, bishop g4 was played. Um, one other thing I was thinking about was why not, when I was looking at the game, I was like, why not bishop d6? Why not trading these bishops here? Because this is another device you can do when you played h6. You can say, well, they can't go back to this diagonal anymore. And if they go to another diagonal, I just challenge and trade. And this is a little bit, this is a, probably a little bit more of a complicated structure, but actually 95 here, as uh, some are suggesting, is not actually it. Because ultimately with 95, the knight isn't particularly stable yet. Um, you can't add another defender to the knight on e5. Um, and there are many, many ways to undermine it. Um, first of all, c5 comes to mind, and then knight c6 might be a possibility, a very active play. But black can also just go queen e7 and knight bd7, and ultimately the knight is just not stable there. Um, now, of course, there was this trick that was pointed out. Um, knight bd7 is not is not a good move because now knight takes f7 is an issue, and you know white's winning a massive pawn and the bishop pair. And this is oh, there's also bishop g6 check. Oof. So all bad things. Um, but the point is, is that that. That dynamic means 95 is not quite, you know, a ready type of move. White's not really ready for it. Um, 95 comes into play when black can't load up on the piece as easily as they can here. Um, uh, because in some circumstances, it is a good move when, uh, especially when h6 has been played already. Because, you know, with, now you can never really evict the knight with f6 because the g6 square is weak. Um, so... Anyways, bishop g4. <laughs> this is a really fascinating structure to me. Um, 
because there was a game I saw a year or two ago um, uh, in the structure. And, and it's, there were some games, I think in season 20 or season 19, some engine matches with the structure. And White here actually just castled. And uh, uh, a lot of times in the structure, actually, Bishop takes F3 is not really such an issue, um, at least in, uh, in, um, in objective terms. I think practically it might be, a, it's more complicated, but um, what might you imagine White's plan to be after Bishop takes F3, G takes F3? Yeah, so I was thinking like if um, Black takes and we take, I thought there's like two ideas that like I'm pretty sure the main one is we go E4 um, and also for protection and for like attacking, we can also go King H1, Rook G1. And then we have like Bishop take H6 threats and like our King is pretty much safe. Yeah, so really the, the, the latter idea is the one that's really key. Like it's like Knight B7, like let's say King H1. And then this idea of just Rook G1 and then doubling the Rooks is surprisingly annoying. Um, now for those of you that might be familiar with like the Chinese dragon, I was kind of thinking in this position that black can pretty easily defend with King H8 and Rook G8, and if needed, even Queen F8. And it seemed to me that, well, there's not really a mate as long as black loads up on the G7, on defending the G7 pawn. And it's actually true, but it's a difficult position to play um, because it's white. Black doesn't have a really concrete active plan and white can improve in different ways. Um, now E4 actually would help black because if you play E4, then the D4 pawn becomes a target. You know, black might get some counterplay in the middle, but of course E4 might be a good move at some point. It's really the doubling of the rooks on the G file, sometimes moving the bishop on F4 out the way and playing F4 yourself. And then rerouting this knight on b1, I saw a game where there was knight, I said b1, but knight on c3, rerouting it from b1 to d2 to f3 to e5. Um, and, you know, amazing things can happen. But there's been a reluctance to actually go for this g takes f3 structure, uh, black players, or because it's, un, it's kind of undesirable um, to defend this. Um, although, it's, to be honest, I think in human play, I, I wouldn't mind playing black necessarily because... If black trades the dark squared bishops somehow after moving the knight, I can imagine, you know, if eventually maybe the structural the structural issue becoming a problem if black defends the maiden attacks. So something to think about there. Now I did very I did jump over because I did ask kind of momentarily after bishop d6, what hat what's the best move here? And I, I neglected to mention it. The move is castles. And the point is the structure after bishop takes f4, e takes f4 um, is pretty annoying if the knight can get to e5 unscathed because you, white just has this pretty annoying grip. And you might say, well, black has a better pawn structure. That's true. But with the grip on the e5 square, it's a little unpleasant. Um, and, uh, you know, you can even, you can try to free your position with c5, but Surprisingly, a lot of times that helps white, like the rook can come to d1, the d5 pawn is kind of weak after an exchange on c5, and it's not, it's just not like a fun, necessarily fun thing to play. So moving on, there's, just, there's so much juice in these positions, it's just fascinating, but we're not even at the skeleton, we're familiar with the skeleton, we're not, we want to keep moving to the, you know, the place where the, the something changes. So. All right, so bishop f4, bishop g4, castles, and knight bd7. So, you know, black didn't go for uh, bishop f3, um, as we spoke about. And now white went knight e5. Kind of funny, because we were talking about the knight not being stable on e5 before. Um, it's a little bit more justified because the bishop on g4 is, is loose. Um, but I, I was a little bit surprised when I saw this. Um, to be honest, I was. And uh, Black, of course, always happy to trade a, a minor piece. And again, you'll see this time and time again, trading one pair of minor pieces alleviates the burden in the position. Um, bishop takes d5. Um, d takes d5 is not desirable here because the knight doesn't have to go to h5. It can go to d7 and um, swing over to c5. So there's nothing desirable about playing like this now. Um, and bishop takes e5. Knight d7. This was a move that really surprised me because, again, I was thinking with the dark squared bishops 
on the board, this is a little bit annoying. Why doesn't black play bishop d6? What's wrong with this? This looks like the most natural move in the world. You challenge the five bishop. It doesn't look super stable. How does white play here? I realize I normally give you like five seconds to answer questions. So give me more, give me more than one move here. Like some people are giving me a move. Give me like a sequence of moves where black might try to challenge the bishop and white tries to justify it there. Oh, no, Mike. Um, well, uh, you were you're right about your first move, um, f4. Of course, you have to kind of justify the bishop, really. I mean, because if bishop takes d6, queen takes d6, eh, it's not, you know, the queen, the rooks are connected. The queen is not so bad here. b4, not really possible yet. Uh, but hold on, we have, <laughs> Brian has solved this technical difficulties. Um, talk to me. Hi. Hello. It works? It does. Okay. I'll play a four here to support the bishop. All right, and let's say I go, let's say I go queen d7. I'm trying to go knight d7 and, tri and, and challenge that bishop ultimately, but I can't go knight d7 right away because my bishop on d6 hangs. So what, what's your follow-up? I might try to play rook a1 and e4. You're right on the money. You're right on the money. And this was something, to be honest, I wasn't super, when I looked at it, I was like, ah, I'm not really buying this. I'm going to improve on your line slightly, but that's exactly the right idea, uh, which is like, we can play h3, kick the bishop away. There's actually no good square it can go to because on h5, you know, even g4 is possible because, uh, because the pawn is on h6, the bishop can just drop back to g6. Um, but even in then that position, we have f5. So the bishop has to go back. e6, it's in the way of pressuring the, the e file. d7 is not so hot either. So because they're trying to go knight d7. So bishop c8. And believe it or not, as you said, astutely, rook a1, knight d7, e4 is just the ball game. Um, and uh, I mean, it, it makes sense. I mean, black's going backward, white's going forward, but it's funny how you just ultimately ditch positional concessions in this line, um, because I'm just like, oh, e4, black will take, and then knight takes, and okay, I understood here that there was problems, but it's just funny how all of a sudden, you know, having an isolated d-pawn is totally fine, because you have all your pieces in the neighborhood of the king and just the king side, and it's just not survivable. <laughs> So uh, excellent, excellent judgment there with rook a1 and e4. So because of that, bishop d6 is not viable. And it's kind of, again, it's kind of showing like, well, this bishop has stayed on the board longer than it needed to, or than we thought it, it had to stay. So very interesting. So anyway, so bishop takes, so bishop e, takes e5, knight d7, challenging that bishop. Of course, we're not allowing uh, the bishop to be taken. So bishop g3. And now knight f8, um, not a very usual move, knight f8 um, in this particular structure, because normally you're trying to get this knight to d6. So a more natural thing, it would be like something like knight b6. Um, sometimes you see like knight b6, knight d8, knight C, d, d6. That's like the way to get the Carlsbad knight. But very important to understand that the Carlsbad knight doesn't mean as much if these dark squared bishops are still on the board because it, it exerts so much pressure. Ooh, that's a terrible arrow. Um, there we go. Because even if the knight is on d6, that Carlsbad uh, knight is just not enough with that bishop still kind of lasering towards the queen side. And so it's just amazing how because the bishops are still on the board, um, it just kind of messes with what white was trying to do uh, or what black is normally trying to do. Um, so very interesting. Uh, I'm very, very interesting. Anyways, uh, knight f8, rook b1, now getting, trying to go for the minority attack. And at last, at last, we have uh, the skeleton I was mentioning with the move a5. So we didn't talk about this one last time. We didn't talk about it uh, thus far today. And this has serious implications uh, for the resulting position. So can anyone kind of tell me what they see is different 
are the same or you know what what kind of dynamics are changing with this A5 move? So we got some, we got some, uh, some, some voices so far. I'm, I'm trying to fish out a fish out a new voice. You know, we got we've got the the usual suspects thus far. Um, uh, you know, I'm I like the usual suspects, but I also like uh, like new suspects. So I'll, I'll give you another thirty seconds or so. All right. So um, uh, Austin. Talk to me about what, what's changed with A5, what dynamics, what's black stopping, what does this allow, et cetera, et cetera. Are you uh, able to unmute? Oh, uh, after uh, A5, White is no longer be able to do his minor minority. Wait, hold on, I'm gonna challenge you there. Why, why isn't White able to do it? What about A3 before? Oh, how does it slows it down? Okay, it slows it down. That's true. It slows it down a little bit. Okay. And I uh huh. Uh, well, uh, yeah. What are you gonna say? No, no, go for it. So, what what else do you see there? So it slows it down, and then you had some other thoughts there. I, I cut you off a little bit. Oh, I think that uh, it weakens B six and C five. So not, uh, like ninety four, ninety C five would be really good. Yeah. So, uh, like you mentioned, it does. Kind of slow down before it does weaken b6 and c5 particularly the b6 square c5 was already kind of there if we wanted it because you know black's not really going to go b6 to stop knight c5 and you could you know you could have gone knight a4 regardless but it's really this b6 square now i do want to just very briefly address like i mean a3 b4 is like viable but the point is is that by playing a5 we actually get something of a skeleton we saw before if white does go for that plan which is that having that open a file after a you know potential like eight let's say a3 uh I don't know, let's just say bishop d6 let's say um this is actually the move that i wanted to be played instead of a5 but bishop takes d6 queen takes d6 b4 let's say takes takes um having this a file is actually really really nice um, so, so a5 actually gives black avenues for counterplay on the half open a file, or excuse me, not half open, completely open a file. And um, that's just a nice thing to have. So, um, so it's just not as desirable for white to do this. And then let's not forget that when you do go b4 and files open up, the knight on c3 is not as stable because there's no pawn on b2 anymore. So in a lot of these positions, actually, as soon as this happens, white would just wait, love if the pawn could just go backwards. If this was checkers, the pawn somehow zigzag back to b2, um, you know, you know, things would be all right. Um, they're not all right. I mean, they're all right here, but it would be something that, you know, white wouldn't necessarily mind. So something to think about. Um, it does weaken b6 though. And that's the really important um, observation because here white actually goes queen b3. And um, this moves calls into question b7. And then all of a sudden you understand, just like we spoke about before with the, you know, this bishop still being on the board, normally black might go for like a move like rook b8 to just cover the pawn. Um, but you can't do that here because the bishop is still staring down that diagonal and you see the presence of the, the dark square bishop still be a source of annoyance. Now, when I was looking at the position, again, as I mentioned, I thought, okay, why not just bishop d6 now? Finally, we have this opportunity. And, um, you know, bishop takes d6 would be played, in my opinion. I see a lot of people ignore um, this type of thing, and they allow bishop takes g3. And this is not, like, terrible for white. But in my opinion, um, this structure is really inferior. Um, uh, this double pawn structure with the g pawns for two pretty significant reasons, maybe three actually. Um, does anyone want to try and figure out one reason or two reasons? I, I mean, there's there are three concrete reasons why I'm not a huge fan of this. Um, so one reason is, so there's no way to play h3. So the bishop's like stable and there's an f3 is kind of weakening. 
Yeah, that might be a fourth reason. I didn't even think of that. But yeah, H3 is, you know, the bishop definitely is a little bit more stable because you can't attack it. Now, again, I'm not so sure if you would have wanted to play H3 because the bishop, let's say the pawn was on H2, you drop the bishop back to E6 or something. And then all of a sudden, queen G5 or queen H4 creates already some th threats because of the, the hook you've, you've kind of created. So uh, I'm not so sure H3 would have been played, but it's true that the G4 square can't be kind of picked off. And so that's actually dovetails kind of nicely into one of the, the reasons I'm not a fan, which is that when you play, uh, when you have the structure, you can't really cover the G4 square again effectively because, um, because F3 weakens the E3 pawn and the G3 pawn now, now that the pawn is on G3. So that's the one first thing is that G4 is loose. What that means is that in certain end games, this knight can very sneakily get to G4 and not just end games, middle games and create mating threats. There's a whole host of back rank problems when the knight's on G4. You can see the king's escape square is taken away. Um, there are all types of funny mates. Like you can imagine like, you know, rook C1 check, king H2, knight G4 check, king H3 h5 or something and then or f5 and then like rook h1 mate one day and it's all because you can't cover the g4 square the other thing is again f3 can't really be played here because these pawns now are both weak and then last but not least um sometimes with the double g pawn structure it actually does create a hook opportunity with h5 h4 um which is something that is extremely instructive to see when it works and I can tell you one of the best games um, I've seen where that structure was kind of employed nicely was a game that Carlson played against Kramnik at the World Blitz Championship, I believe it was. It was World Blitz World Rapid right before things shut down in 2019. At the end of the year, they played that. Um, and, uh, you know, Kramnik was retired, but he came out of retirement to play this, this World Blitz. And... What he, and Carlson was white. He was actually playing a London system where there was an early exchange in the center that made a Carlsbad structure. And he played the opposite. So Black had double G pawns and he played H4, H5 and got fantastic play on the H file. So I strongly recommend if you want an example of that, uh, look at that. Um, uh, yeah. So moving on. Um, not very desirable to go for that. So I thought, okay, you know, takes, takes, what's not to like? And, you know, to, thankfully my Carlsbad understanding was not so poor that this was like a bad position. It was just an option the computer didn't go for, frankly. Um, but it's actually something I think is pretty viable and would be the natural choice for me, uh, given that I was saying, get rid of these dark square bishops, get rid of these dark square bishops. Anyway, what we're treated to because this doesn't happen is some real fireworks. So uh, let's enjoy them. So anyway, so a5, queen b3, attacking the b7 pawn. Kind of difficult to defend that. Um, you don't want to go b6 or b5 because then the c pawn is weak. So you play a move like b5, all of a sudden a move like queen c2, and the knight moves out of the way to e2 probably, and you have new problems. Um, so black instead went queen d7. And after queen d7, uh, we had the move that was, you know, illustrated uh, earlier, which was knight a4. And, it, and you look at this, and you're like, wow, like, this is not going to go well, because white has this pressure on the, the queen side that just seems like very difficult to defend. Um, and from here, the game just takes some really magical twists and turns tactically. It's like, like move after move after move. It's like, what in the world is going on? Um, and so you have to imagine that the sequence was foreseen quite a bit to allow knight a4 and queen d7. And I just thought that it's worth it to understand why is black okay here? Because it doesn't seem obvious to me. So the first, so I'm just going to say some of these moves are just like, what is going on? But we'll understand them together. So first of all, Rook a7. Um, now we see rook a7 sometimes in slavs, right? Like a6 slavs. Um, but you never really feel great about it. <laughs> you're like, well, you're splitting your rooks. That's not super desirable. Um, but it's really like the only move in a way. 
I mean, like, there's no other way to kind of deal with knight b6 and knight c5 in a reasonable way. If you part with the dark squared bishop, that's not going to be so hot. And just this fork in general is extremely annoying. Um, and, you know, what do you do with your pieces? I mean, if you go rook d8, knight b6 is still an issue. And then bishop c7 uh, wins an exchange. Um, I mean, there's really, so rook a7 is kind of like an only move. Um, and after rook a7, white played queen b6. And this looks also very annoying. Like the rook is hit. What do you do with it? Uh, knight c5 is also an idea still. Rook can't go to a6 because the bishop is controlling a6. Yeah, I mean, it really does look bad. Like it looks like what is in the world is going on. And this is the thing that's kind of fun about chess is you see white kind of encroaching and leverage, making all these gains on the queen side and then things happen. So um, when I was, I was analyzing this, it, it, rook a8 back is actually a move, um, not a move I would play any day of the week. Um, in fact, it allows knight c5, which I think means uh, black would have to part with the dark squared bishops. So not a thrilling development, but instead, Black played rook e a8. Okay, this just looks like madness to me. I mean, like, what in the world is this? Like, these rooks parked on the a file, the gains made on the queen side. And now white played something I thought was really, really interesting and remarkable. And I'll, I'll give a minute in change to kind of figure out what, what's what or what was played here. Because the next several moves, it's like, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh. You got, is your, is your audio yeah, working? Um, there I we want, go. I want to play Bishop B8. I'm not so sure that it works, but it looks fancy. So yay. That's the move. That's the move. I mean, it's it's like, it kind of, I've never seen a tactic like that before. Um, now, I mean, I, I have gone on the record and I mean, I, I, this, I, I do have a, some degree of awareness that like, Tactics are by far the worst part of my game. So maybe maybe you youngsters have seen this before several times over, but I just kind of thought Bishop D8 is like the coolest thing I've seen in a minute. Like it's just like just putting the bishop on that square on, on that on the opponent's side of the board like that. You know, also seemingly winning an exchange uh, cleanly. It just it seemed very just like just attractive to me. Um, so yeah, what what a stunner. What a stunner. Um, and the funny thing about it is like, now the line just begins. So I think we can just enjoy some of the tactics, try to understand what's going on. And, um, I had some of you were mentioning queen B3, which is an interesting idea trying to go maybe knight B6 again, but I think, and I, I mean, I have to think about it, but I think maybe the black just moves the rook back and you can have one of these exotic engine, uh, repetitions that you can have sometimes um, because I think now the knight goes to b6 black can go queen d8 and things are actually kind of covered so I think queen b3 is not like the mo it's not like ending the game essentially um, and if maybe after rook e8 if they, you go knight c5 black can maybe try queen c8 and then because I still I'm, I'm not going to give up the dark squared bishop if I don't have to and then if I go knight d7 I get this knight of the board and I keep the structural integrity in the position. So anyways, Bishop B8, <laughs> so, so cool. It's like, it's like, so awesome. And now black has to like play ball. Like this is like, you know, very serious move and black played Bishop D8. Um, it's, it's, it's an only move basically. I mean, there's one other move in the position um, and it's kind of interchangeable with the, with this move because this, the sequence the, the variation is the same. You can flip the move order. So it's there's another move that's also possible in addition to bishop d8, and you're going to see it on the next move. So the bishop hits the queen. Bishop takes a7. That looks pretty awesome because if bishop takes b6, knight takes b6, we have a fork, and that position, two, uh, two rooks against the queen, but with the bishop pair, I kind of am intrigued by and prefer white. Not so clear though, uh, frankly, it's actually still about equal because um, I mean, 
to me, queen takes a8 would be the most natural move in the world, but apparently knight d7 is also really effective. The point being that the knight is still trapped, and it's really important to not allow black to comfortably retain the bishop pair. So what a stunner, what a stunner. But I'm going to argue not more stunning than the game, because after, uh, after bishop takes a7, we had bishop h3. And I just, I just love this. I mean, it just, I know you're just like, oh, okay, like computers, oh, of course. But like, I think the cool thing about this is it kind of, kind of, in a way, demonstrates the kind of, the, the tug of war that's happening in a lot of Carlsbad structure positions, which is that white, it's almost like a King's Indian in a way, even though it, you know, people don't necessarily think about it that way, but it's that white is trying to leverage advantages on the queen side and then when white tilts their energy to the queen side black it tilts it to the king side and creates trouble and this bishop h3 move there's no hook on the board on the king side uh, that white's created but black can still attack so very very cool move um uh someone want to tell me why queen takes d8 does not work yeah, I see a, a bunch of people flooding in. Um, uh, Liam, go for it. Ah, uh, because of Queen G four four. Yeah, and I don't know. I just, I mean, I, this is a move I think many of you see instantly, but I just think the touch there is just, just it's just gorgeous. Like Bishop H three, Queen G. I mean, you're like, and it's all, and it's all of a sudden it's like, wow, Black was in trouble, and you know, all of a sudden it, Black's getting counterplay. So the rest of the game is really, you know tactics that you know could be kind of tough for us to understand but i think it's important to understand the resources black has this position and the resources white has so let's just take a, let's just continue to enjoy so bishop h3 was played g takes h3 is kind of uh, forced and then after bishop takes b6 finally bishop takes b6 um it's kind of all equalish here the point is that Taking on h3 creates a uh, perpetual check threat. So if you have knight takes b6, queen takes h3 is, uh, is still kind of a draw here with queen g4. So, you know, the computers, I, that's the other thing that's great about TSEC now is that a lot of these programs are, are kind of trained to play the, keep the game going uh, by all means necessary as long as the objective evaluation doesn't change. And so they're going to, they're not going to, they don't repeat like they used to unless that's the only option um, that keeps the game and keeps the balance. So they both are trying. So this, this really is a great opportunity for us to understand, all right, what are the dynamics here? What is the tug of war even here? And after bishop takes b6, which does keep the game going, queen takes h3, bishop e2. So now white's saying, no draw. We're not, we're not, you know, we're not having a repetition yet. I have uh, two bishops and a rook for the queen, that's a you know winning material advantage if I'm able to consolidate. And you have to kind of see, well, you know, can white consolidate? And it's, it's just a fascinating to kind of look through this. Um, uh, but uh, I'll spend a little, I'm gonna go through this quicker because of, uh, you know, our time constraints. Um, but bishop e2, covering g4, rook e8, getting that rook into the game, getting the initiative going. The only advantage Black has here is the king safety uh, issue. Um, king h1, trying to get out the way. It is an interesting question, though. Uh, Nathaniel, you did mention knight c5. Um, do you want to kind of answer your own question and maybe consider what Black may try to do after knight c5? I didn't, to be honest, I, I, didn't, I didn't look at this move, um, which, and I probably should. Um, but can you imagine maybe what Black would try to do here? Knight g6 and knight h4. Yeah, that one looks very interesting to me. Knight g6, knight h4. I think they, like this bishop is out of play. Maybe there's some quick counterplay here. Maybe even knight e6. I, I would have to. I would have. These things need to be checked. Um, but uh, but I like your idea here. Knight g6. Like so, let's say knight g6, king h1, knight h4, rook g1, only move. Knight f3, rook g2. I mean, white seems to kind of be okay here. Although, okay, there's a, there, 
if the rook could swing over, we might have a queen takes h2 mate, an Arabian mate, right? But it's not so easy with the knight and the pawn covering every square. Um, so my my instinct tell, tells me that maybe knight e6 could be better, but who knows? I mean, really, like, I mean, who knows? Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I really would like to get the rook to the h file, but I'm not sure how to get there. So it needs to be checked. Anyways, um, rookie eight, king h1, rookie six, knight c3. Now the rook is getting there quickly. Rook g6, threatening mate. Rook g1, defending the mate. Queen f5, I think a lovely queen retreat. I think the vast majority of us would just be so focused on the attack, we would be kind of very much in vain trying to add fuel to the fryer on, on these squares on the g file. Um, and frankly, the, the strength the queen is that it can shift from back back and forth in a way that you know is difficult for uh, the pieces to deal with. So queen f5 keeps an eye on these light squares still, um, but also maybe add, you know creates a queen c2 idea at some point. And also, let's not forget f2 is hanging. Uh, rook g2 is played, takes takes knight g6. This knight's going to h4. Bishop c7. This bishop pops out. Get some reinforcements, h5, and you know again more attacking resources, h5, h4, perhaps h3. You know we've seen alpha zero, you know do these things. Everyone knows about rook pawn moves now, and the game continues. I mean it, it ends in a draw, um, but I mean, h3, queen c8 again. The queen retreats. Um, these are the hardest moves for, for I think humans to see actually these these long queen moves like going, especially going backwards. We just don't see them. And the idea here um, is that the bishop needs to stay on this diagonal or it, it would like to stay on this diagonal, but with combination with h5, it actually can't. Because <laughs> if you go bishop g3, there's h4. If you go bishop f4, maybe there's knight takes. If you go bishop e5, there's f6. If you go bishop d6, there's queen d7. And so you can also probably have acute repetition along these lines, but the computers keep it going. So bishop takes a5, knight h4, king h1, c5, more madness. Um, <laughs> I mean, really just amazing stuff. Um, queen f5 back, queen takes f2, and then we finally have a position where black actually gets a piece or loses a piece, but then immediately gets it back with c takes d4, and then a few more tactics, and we get to one of these, these draws where people are like, oh, okay, chess might be a draw after all um, with this play. And then there, there you have it, a repetition after they, they've exhausted the, the ways they can keep the game going. So um, even a fantastic final position, I mean, rook takes f7 is, you know, kind of something that, you know, white has to, you know, that black has to think about. So black can just waltz in and queen um, without uh, losing, so. Anyway, I kind of rapid fired that end point, um, uh, the last 15 or so moves, but super, super uh, instructive game, in my opinion. Um, there was another one I wanted to show with a really funky structure, um, but uh, um, we're not gonna have that time for that. But if we just go back to the moment here, um, early on, we are discussing the dynamics of, you know, why is this light, this dark square bishop's not been traded yet? How's it staying on the board? Uh, what are the dynamics behind keeping it? I think the conclusion you can draw is that by delaying castling, actually, by delaying castling and going for knight f3, you can cause some problems that basically uh, challenge black's ability to kind of secure the bishop quickly, because you might, again, have this h3 move that allows your bishop to fall back to f4 and then go back to h2. Of course, if the bishop goes to d6, um, you can't really avoid trading those bishops, especially after h6 has been played. But you castle and you say, uh, I'm cool with the double pawns because the knight comes to e5, which is an annoying grip. Um, so we saw that tug of war with the, the bishop. Uh, again, the double g, the doubled f pawns are not really an issue. There haven't been many, if any, really, really good human tests of this. Um, but so you might want to, you know, see what happens here, but that pressure on the G file is significant. 
Um, black is by no means lost or anything. Um, black just has to defend well. I would recommend trying to trade these dark squared bishops um, and then trying like what I affectionately called like the Chinese dragon, reverse Chinese dragon strategy, where you go like king h8, rook g8, um, just like in the Chinese dragon, white will go like king b1, king a1, and then rook b1 and defend against batteries on the, the b file, or in this case, the g file. Um, and then of course, the skeleton with a5, which you know is nice because it slows down the typical minority and gives play, but weakens these dark squares. You really have to be confident about you know some of the ideas that you're going to have to deal with with knight a4. Um, it is important, I didn't mention this, but knight a4, it's important that if you do it right away, black might go knight d7 and cover these squares. So the other value of queen b3 is it kind of forces black to put a piece on an inconvenient square. And so queen d7 quite simply doesn't allow knight d7. So that kind of changed the game. And then, you know, tactics are, you know, it's always good to see tactics you haven't seen before learn different, see different, uh, I haven't seen before, let me speak for myself. And, you know, maybe, maybe you can implement them in your own games uh, sometime because a lot of that's just pattern recognition. So anyways, uh, I'll leave it at that uh, for this time. And um, yeah, I hope you could, you know, hopefully implement some of these themes or concepts in your own games.